So I think that the way that Bitcoiners think about infrastructure is a little bit like playing Jenga. And the way that that works, if you haven't played Jenga, is you take like a stack of blocks and kind of power them up and you like take one out and you put it on top. And what you're saying is like you start with something secure and, you know, stable. And if you carefully add things one by one, you eventually get, you know, like a, a tall tower of things that are available. Um, and, you know, like it, it should grow to whatever height you want it to be. Um, in the Ethereum world, I don't think that that's really done. Um, and it's not necessarily good or bad either way. But the way that Ethereum works is you're just like, well, if you have like, I don't know how many blocks you have in Jenga usually, but let's say 100 blocks, you're only going to get so high eventually. But what we're going to do is we're just going to dump 10 times more blocks and we're just going to have a big pile of blocks and like that'll probably like get there eventually. And for better or for worse, uh, if you go and recently I've become, I have like a telegram group where there's like a, like a 100, 200 people. I'm like, you know, Bitcoin or learn solidity. I've been taking a serious look at what's, what exists in the Ethereum infra, you know, ecosystem to learn what tools are available, what the state of the art is, because I want to produce the similes of that for Bitcoin so that these tools are available for, for you guys to all use. And, you know, honestly, there's a lot of good stuff. Like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of jumble, but there's a lot of pretty interesting infrastructure that exists for Ethereum that it's going to take Bitcoin a very long time to get to to make that actually like available for developers to build uh, products and services on top of. And I think that it is worthwhile thinking through like as a community, like what our priorities are in terms of incrementalism and in progress versus accelerationism. And I think that we right now are on one extreme, Ethereum is on another extreme, but there's you know ground to be gained on for either side on like a more moderate strategy where you're saying, okay, like we actually do want to fund more like moonshot efforts because if one, if it actually works out, and I think that you see this in Ethereum where like um, some of these like ZK roll up things like, or, you know, whatever optimistic roll ups or tornado cash, like those are actually kind of starting to work. It looks like, and that's going to like, that's just like a jumble. Like there's all this, you know, crap coming out that's useless, but Hey, actually for payments protocols, like some of the things that are happening are actually looking pretty neat like might actually solve some of these fundamental problems. Bitcoin, because we go so incrementally, uh, we don't capture any of the potential volatility and things that could be built that are like further out that we can then, you know, connect back to, to what we're doing. So I'd like to see more of that in Bitcoin. I'd like to see us more aggressive in developing tooling that is clearly in the prototype category. If you look back historically in computing, you can watch Douglas Engelbart's The Demo. It's a video which basically shows like an entire modern technology stack like but it's in 1960 it's you know like there's like a video call there's collaborative coding there's like there's like everything was done and they knew how to make a demo for that they didn't know how to actually make the infrastructure for everyone in the world to be able to do it but i think what that did was it set a clear goal for like what the community was trying to build of you know the computing community in general and i think ult ultimately we're talking about how bitcoiners are jealous of you know like maybe the the, the DeFi stuff they want to get in on that that's what ethereum is doing right now is they're defining the types of applications eventually that people really are going to want to interact with whether or not they're degenerate and scammy right now is, is one question but if you actually look at things like uniswap i think it's a good example screw their governance token like i don't care about it but like if you actually look at the design of uniswap like that's pretty interesting like there's a, there's a real, you know, like use for that. And there's a real goal. And if we could have something like Uniswap on Bitcoin for all the colored coins on Bitcoin, like that would be great. Now we don't know how to scale it, but as a demo, it's actually really quite compelling. And it gives the community something to, you know, coalesce on and say like, okay, well, we're going to figure out how we can actually provide and offer this. And we, you know, maybe have a design language around how you can build secure applications that people can download and run and what plugins should look like, how people should be verifying these sources. Like Ethereum is building up that, information and i'm worried that e e even though ethereum's foundation is is significantly weaker than bitcoin if you go up just like one layer they're going way ahead and have a lot of tooling that we just like don't have right now and you know I, i'm not i don't hate our approach like i still think it's the winning approach if i had to pick between one or the other but i think that what i'm trying to do personally is like go a few years out and build a lot of the stuff to, to let people kind of imagine and dream what bitcoin is going to do and Hopefully that's going to motivate the way that uh, technology progresses for Bitcoin. Sorry, I'm long-winded, but I'll like drink half my drink after saying that.
No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for yeah. bringing that. And who, yeah, Parker, looks like you want to jump in. Yeah, I was just, you know, I think from from my perspective, it's we think that that foundation is everything. Uh, that adoption of Bitcoin is exclusively because of that secure foundation. Uh, or at least I, I don't want to speak for everyone on un chain, but but my view, and I think for the view that, that a lot of us hold is is consistent with that. That the that the reason why Bitcoin is viable is because 21 million is a credibly fixed number and that the existence of Bitcoin in many ways or practically in my personal opinion in every way obsoletes all other forms of money. Um, and so that that secure foundation it is the nexus of everything and such that because these other currencies have weak foundations and because Bitcoin exists that kind of the whatever they're building on top is as we get to that as an application. And again, I think about it from a perspective of maybe 2% of people in the world have Bitcoin today or have any material exposure to it. And in the future, that's gonna be 100%. And that it's going to be 100% because the foundation is secure. And that if 2% of people have Bitcoin today and 100% of people are going to have it, the two most pressing things that we need to do, even though they're incredibly okay. vanilla, are help people buy Bitcoin and help people secure Bitcoin. And kind of in our context, Help people hold on to it for the long term, and that occasionally means, um, you know, borrowing against their Bitcoin should they need to. I think as Bitcoin adoption increases, again, a, a less sexy thing or, or more vanilla thing, but then it becomes as de as as population density increases, then payments are going to become the next logical thing to do. That's something that has been solved before at an application layer, but not necessarily in Bitcoin. So things like BTC Pay Server then become you know, increasingly interested to, 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 what, to what, what it is we're doing. But, but again, everything really stems from that foundation and it really will, I think in, in our view, guide what happens in the next you know, 10 years at least. If I can jump in real quick, I would, I would add, you know, the way that I see building on uh, uh, Bitcoin, building finance on Bitcoin is actually, it's like a simplification of what Bitcoin, or I mean, what finance actually is. I'll, I'll drink after all this. Um, but basically, you know, the way that I kind of see the world today is the, the only way that you can get ahead in the financial world is to basically just create all of these ridiculous financial tools, all of this leverage, all of this, you know, complication where the middleman kind of takes from everyone else. And like, that's the only way that it can continue to grow is to create this new kind of complexity in the system. And, you know, part not of what Bitcoin growth. offers is not real growth, right. Uh, but part of what Bitcoin offers is like this system where, you know, you can just hold your Bitcoin, be secure, lend it out. You know, that's something that'll never kind of leave society lending. But so many of these other financial products that we have in today are just like ways to try and rat race yourself uh, into success. I just don't think, you know, a, a functioning financial system needs that. Uh, so I would just throw in that one of the things that building, you know, uh, finance on Bitcoin is, is really just simplifying it and making, you know, what is the drilling down to the core of what people need in their financial products and just building that. Uh, I think that's a, a really awesome kind of uh, addition that Bitcoin creates. So uh, I want to jump in here and I'm sorry, I'm going to actually go yeah. to you, Russell, but um, I know Tantra Labs, you guys do do some like DeFi stuff. Like mm -hmm. I'm actually curious, like is what's happening on Ethereum something that you guys like think is worth paying attention to and worth looking yeah. at as a case study to bring back to Bitcoin? Or is it something where it's just pure noise and like the future is going to be built in a different light? Absolutely. And it's so funny. I was, I am in total agreement with Jeremy. And I think at Tantra, we reflect a lot of the ways he's thinking about the technology. You know, in the beginning, a lot of people said, you know, Litecoin is the testing ground for Bitcoin, but really money is the testing ground for Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was created because we saw the money experiment fail. And so at Tantra, Kagan, my co-founder, and we just had a podcast about Ethereum where we talk about all this. And it's it's basically, I'm going to say some words that'll make everybody, um, I'll just put a different thought in your head. It's that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. Ethereum is a Ponzi scheme. The US dollar is a Ponzi scheme. And so the idea is you're playing a game. Money is a game and we were all born into it. And in order to live and operate in the world in which we exist, we have to play that game. Unless you want to go live in a cave and become a monk or whatever it is, you have to play the game. And so Bitcoin, like Parker is saying, and I totally agree, the rules are set. 
there's 21 million. There will only ever be 21 million. It's verifiably true. And with Ethereum, you know, it's a little bit different. You know, they have inflation, they have all these other things. And we're not going to get into that debate. But the whole point is that with your money, what do you want to do? What is it that human beings want to do with money? And I think Uniswap is a great example of utility. And think about like for the last what are you, 100 years, if you wanted to go to the stock market and order stocks or shares or own something, you need a broker. It was hard to do. You had to call somebody. Then it was on a computer. Even today, it's a market order or a limit order or a stop loss or I have this many shares. It's fucking complicated. Uniswap, you click a button. You literally say, I want to take this, turn it into this. Okay. That's innovation. And that is truly like power to the people because now you can take something that was so esoteric, so complex, so difficult and you put it into the hands of the people and you give them the ability to do that with their money, with their sovereignty and nobody can tell them yes or no or don't do that. And I think in so many ways, we've talked about this for a long time. It's like uh, in 2017, Ethereum led the bull run because people wanted ICOs and they wanted to come into this market and the way that they came in. Sorry, but I disagree with that. It just, that's the mirage, but. Well, I mean, you can, if you look at the data, it, it shows that the price was there for Ethereum. People were buying Ethereum to get into ICOs and then putting money back into Bitcoin, putting money back into Ethereum. And the reason that is, is because human beings are greedy. We want money. This is right now, this market, and we all know it. Most of the people are here playing a money game. Like, until you get people that are like one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, people st- still are saying one Bitcoin is worth $11,000 today. It's, you're, not, you're still thinking in the old mindset. You're still playing the old game. And so- yep. There's and, a transitionary period though. Yeah. So well, why, exactly. is, why is what's like that transitionary period, why is that not skeuomorphic? So the way that I think about it is like, you have to give people what they already understand, which is what Ethereum did and is doing. It's giving people CDPs, it's giving them leverage, it's giving them loans, it's giving them degenerate bullshit to make and lose all of their money. And so now you're getting everybody coming in to do things that they're familiar with. Not everybody's familiar with hard money, you know, Austrian economics, not everybody agrees with it. And it's not as um, fun. It might be a way to put it. And again, this is all, you know, opinion, but I, I personally believe a lot of Ethereum is a testing ground for what utility can we build with money that makes sense for people. And not that I think leverage is one of those things. I do agree. I think peer to peer lending is great. Uh, I think Uniswap is great because it makes it really easy for people. And I'd love to see these things on Bitcoin. Um, uh, ultimately, I think anything in crypto that we start to take money away from the banking system and we start to put it in a public place where everybody can verify transactions, everybody can see what's going on, no matter what, it pushes Bitcoin forward. And I will, I will always be Bitcoin to the core because I think that hard money in general is it's the only game that no one can change. Like, you just can't change it. It's there. It's written in code and you agree to it. Let's jump in, Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is interesting because um, I, I agree with both uh, Russell and, and Jeremy that, that Ethereum is a good testing ground, but I think it's a good testing ground for what, you know, what should be done, in, um, what should and can be done in Bitcoin and also what shouldn't be done. And like the way that, yeah, that it's absolutely. architectured um, because um, like, like one thing that's interesting is, um, is uh, as Russell mentioned, like the freedom of what you can do in Ethereum and the freedom um, of, of being able to go on Uniswap and swap any asset that you want. Uh, but at the same time, that freedom is actually parasitic to the Ethereum chain itself. So, you know, um, you know people don't realize that Tether, ERC-20 Tether is parasitic to Ethereum. Um, uh, <laughs> once Ethereum goes to proof of stake, um, you know, CDPs where you can lock up your Ethereum and get DAI is parasitic to the chain because it, it takes Ether away from, um, you know, from uh, from securing the chain. 
Um, and so I, I think it's I think it's important for us to realize in Bitcoin, like you know, uh, how can we ensure that the soundness um, of of uh, of BTC itself, um, while while and, and and while also enabling all these different um, financial applications to be created without negatively affecting you know what people can do with um, Bitcoin today. Um, so so yeah, I think I that that's where drink. a lot of uh, corn people have some weird ideas about the free market where ultimately in a free market consumers will consume goods that are like most sufficient and like give them what they want and i think if you look at the censorship resistance angle of bitcoin and now i have to drink i tried um if you look <laughs> at the censorship resistance of bitcoin then from that perspective, Bitcoin is hyper libertarian, right? Like we, we all know exactly what, but if you look at the technological availability, Bitcoin is hyper authoritarian. It's like, here are the things that you can do. And it's just that. And if you want to get anything even incrementally more, you have to convince everyone in the world. And there are people who will like singularly make it a campaign to like stop you. And I think that that is you know, like, there are some strengths to that, but it ends up being a much more closed society. And what I what I worry about is that in the world, like it doesn't really care about like principles. It just cares about like, did you get shit done for the lowest cost? Like that's the way that the world works ultimately. And right now, essentially for Ethereum, you can imagine it that people are saying, we want to experiment and play with these things. We want to have these things available. And actually we're willing to pay these absurd privacy and uh, gas and stability costs in order to get access to these things right now. So it's not that there's a problem with Ethereum the way it is. It's just that people are willing to pay these costs in risk yeah. exposure to get access to the platform. So, mm -hmm. you know, if Bitcoin had it available, people would do it on Bitcoin, but it's not available. And that's fine for Bitcoin to compete in the larger market. The risk is that if we ignore what's going on there, like one day if people decide this is what they want, like that is going to exist as an ecosystem. Like if Uniswap is really great, that will be the way that people expect to be able to trade goods on a blockchain, right? It's going to be the best way. It's, and maybe it's not right now, but eventually maybe it will get there. And I think that, you know, if we're sitting saying, okay, well, hopefully one day we're just going to figure out how to offer it. We are not capturing the value that these ecosystems will capture. I mean, I would put, like who here would put money down on ETH, but they get rid of Ethereum and then they make the Uniswap governance token, like the main asset. Like to me, that sounds cool. Cause then, you know, it's ideally something that is voting that's balanced on all the tokens. It solves some of the issue with um, that, that Matt brought up with like, oh, all these things are rival to the proof of stake. Like, okay, if you find mm -hmm. a way to make proof of stake happen through, you know, LP providers and Uniswap, then, you know, maybe that magically, you know, makes proof of stake aligned on, you know, like how much economic weight is voting. So I think that there is like a real risk that if we don't, um, if we don't actually like push the envelope on what we what we have a pathway to making available, other ecosystems will do that, and then they'll get economic interest. And it's sort of like uh, Tor. So Tor is actually one of the worst privacy networks for privacy, but it's efficient, right? There are other things like Mixnets. Uh, there, what, what there's like I forget the name of some of the other ones that actually have significantly better uh, anonymity properties, but nobody uses them because they're inefficient. And because they're inefficient, like their anonymity set is smaller. And so your, your privacy is actually worse because it actually matters to be in the biggest pool with the most other people. So you might have a future where all the hardcore sound money enthusiasts are using Bitcoin, but that's like, you know, the, the room of us, uh, us eight, you know, and that's it. And, um, you know, there exists another ecosystem, which includes a lot more people who want more diverse things. And then that's actually where most people are getting most of their stuff. And, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I want Bitcoin to be Ethereum and I want us to have everything that's available there. I'm just saying that like we need like, you, you know, we, we need to provide a little bit more. We need, to, we need to go a little bit further than we're going right now to make these things available. And also from a self-sovereign point of view, I don't want to tell people that the best thing to do is uh, to like use some service for custody. I want to have like, yeah. hey, look, here we have self-sovereign custody, best in class, better than anything else that you could ever do. Bitcoin, number one, best. Like that's, that's what I want. So, you know, if anyone wants to jump in.